Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the cellular metabolism. And in this context, in the previous lecture, we have discussed about the carbohydrate metabolism. So we have discussed about the how the glucose is being phosphorylated uh, within the glycolysis, and that's how it, the, that particular glucose is going to be committed for the glycolysis and further uh, you know further in degradation into the uh, Krebs cycle so that it will be able to produce the energy and this energy what it is going to be produced is uh, in the form of ATP or in the in the form of reducing equivalence and this energy is uh, going to be utilized for many of the anabolic reactions. So, uh, apart from the uh, carbohydrate, we also have another molecule which is called uh, lipids and these lipids are also been the major source of energy within the cell. So, in today's lecture, we are first going to discuss about the uh, catabolic reactions of the lipid metabolic metabolisms and how it is actually generating the energy and subsequent to that, we are also going to discuss about the anabolic reactions and at the end of this lecture we are also going to discuss about the uh, how the body is managing the different types of metabolic byproducts so uh, as uh, we have discussed in the uh, past also in, in the previous lecture also that when you talk about the cellular metabolisms you can have the two different types of metabolism one is catabolism where you are actually going to have the energy producing reactions and within the catabolism you are actually going to have the two different types of uh, biomolecules you can have the uh, carbohydrate and or you can have the lipids uh, carbohydrates are actually going to be processed within the uh, glycolysis followed by the Krebs cycle whereas the lipids are actually going to be processed under the beta oxidation and uh, ultimately both of these processes are going to produce large of large quantity of energy in the form of ATP slash NADH okay and uh, this energy is actually going to be utilized into the anabolic reaction where you are going to have the biosynthetic pathway. So within the anabolic, uh, anabolic reactions we are going to discuss about the uh, protein synthesis or amino acid synthesis and uh, at the end we are also going to discuss when you are going to do the catabolic reactions or the anabolic reactions uh, they both are actually going to produce the uh, waste material right and this waste material also need to go through with the some of the metabolic pathways so that it can be detoxifies so let's start with the beta oxidations so beta oxidation as the name suggests is actually a, a metabolic pathway which is required for the lipids and uh, you know the lipid is a chain uh, is, a, is a carbon is, a, is, a, is made up of, of the fatty acids plus glycerol right and uh, this fatty acid part is actually going to be utilized into the beta oxidation to produce the energy and how we are going to get the fatty acids right so when we consume the uh, lipids uh, the into the food right? for example if we take the food right for example if we take the pizza right so pizza is actually going to have the lipid right and that lipid is actually going to be digested by the enzyme which is called lipase and that's how it is actually going to generate the fatty acid and then the fatty acid is going to be absorbed by the small intestine and uh, ultimately it is going to be transported to the uh, liver and it is also going to be transported to the other body parts and it is actually going to be used uh, for the beta oxidation to generate the energy. 
Now, before we get into the uh, the uh, beta oxidations, we have to first very briefly see how the all these things are actually working. So, uh, what you are going to do is when you are going to take the fat into the food, fat will get into the stomach. So, there is no digestion of the fa fat into the stomach, right? And then it will enter into the small intestine. When it enter into the small intestine, the bile salt which is going to be released from the gallbladder is actually going to emulsify the fat. So what is mean by the emulsification is that it is actually going to make the fat, mo fat molecules uh, more polar in nature so that it will get dissolved into the aqueous environment and so that the, it will actually going to be have the proper action of the different enzymes. So this in this process of the emulsification, it is actually going to form the micelles and the fatty acids. And then it is actually going to present into the small intestine where it is actually going to be digested and that's how it is actually going to produce the fatty, fatty acids. These fatty acids are then going to be, uh, you know, uh, taken up by the, uh, by taken up into the blood and that's how it is actually going to form the, uh, the uh, calomicrons. And then these chylomicrons uh, are actually going to transfer to the capillary, the blood to the different tissues. So it is actually going to travel in the form of a uh, chylomicrons and these chylomicrons are uh, going to be targeted to the different organs depending upon the type of protein what is present onto the cell surface. Uh, onto the surface of these chylomicrons and uh, that's how they are actually going to deliver the uh, fat to the brain, muscles, livers and also on, right? And uh, the fatty acids which are entered into the myocytes and adipocytes where they undergo the degradation or the beta oxidations. Uh, and once the, it is going to go through the beta oxidation, it is actually going to produce the carbon dioxide, it is actually going to produce the ATP and it is also going to produce a reducing equivalence. Now, why there is a need to have the beta oxidations? So, beta oxidation is the sequential removal of the two carbon fragments from the carboxyl end of the fatty acids. During the process, the acetyl-CoA is going to form as the bond between alpha and beta carbon atoms are broken. It is named so because the beta carbon of the fatty acid is oxidized and the process occurs inside the mitochondria. So beta oxidation occurs within the mitochondria, right? And why it is called beta oxidation? Because the bond between the alpha and beta chain is actually going to be broken, right? So this is actually the acid part, right? And this is the alpha carbon, this is the beta carbon. So what will happen is that in a cyclic reactions, the bond between the alpha and beta is actually going to be broken down. And that's how this portion is actually going to be released and it is actually going to form the acetyl coa okay? And this portion is uh, then going to be transported into the Krebs cycle and uh, the, it, it is going to be oxidized into the Krebs cycle. Remember that the acetyl-CoA is actually uh, going to be, uh, you know, um, combined with the, uh, within the Krebs cycle and it is actually going to form the citric acid, right? And that's how it is actually going to enter into the Krebs cycle. So, beta oxidation is actually the reaction which are going to lead to the breakdown of this particular fragment and in this process also it is actually going to generate some energy. So you can imagine that if you have a carbon of pentadecanoic acid, it is actually going to have the this kind of breakage after every two carbons, right? So it is actually going to have a breakage here, it is going to have a breakage here, it is going to have a breakage here, like that, right? And all these two chain carbons are actually going to be get converted into the acetyl coa and then these acetyl coa will be transported or will be uh, be a part of the Krebs cycle and that's how it is actually going to produce the energy. So beta oxidation is that it is actually going to produce the uh, acetyl-CoA from the long chain uh, fatty acids and, uh, uh, and then acetyl-CoA will enter into the Krebs cycle. 
so this process also requires the multiple steps right first of the step is that it actually requires the activation of the lipid molecules and then the transported of the lipid molecules within the mitochondria remember that the beta oxidation will occur inside the mitochondria uh, compared to that the carbohydrate metabolism starts from the cytosol so the fatty acids are activation and the transportation to the mitochondria enzymes for the beta oxidations are located in the mitochondrial matrix which means the liquid part of the mitochondria the fatty acids with chain length greater than uh, 14 cannot cross the mitochondrial membrane as such therefore they are first undergo activation and then transportation aided by the three enzymatic reactions once the fatty acid reach the target cell their activation take place in the cytosol so fatty acid activation is a atp dependent acylation reaction in which the fatty acid is activated by the coenzyme a and ATP to form the fatty acyl CoA with the help of an enzyme which is called as acyl CoA synthetase, uh, or it is also called as acyl CoA ligase or acyl CoA thiokinase. Thus, acyl CoA synthetase catalyzes the formation of a thioester linkage between the carboxyl group of the fatty acid and the thiol group of the coenzyme A to yield the molecule which is called as fatty acid, fatty acyl CoA. So this is the fatty acid, right? And this group is going to be combined with this group, right? And that's how it is actually going to form the fatty acyl CoA. And in this reaction, the ATP is actually going to be consumed because you know that they, they, it is forming a high energy bond, right? So this this is actually going to be linked to the CoA, right? And uh, that's how it is going to form the fatty acyl CoA. And the energy what is present in the ATP is actually going to be consumed. Now, once you have generated the fatty acyl CoA, you are actually going to commit this particular lipid for beta oxidation. Which means you have already invested some energy or you have already invested some amount of energy into this so that you can be able to uh, send this lipid for the beta oxidation inside the mitochondria and then it is actually going to be uh, you know generate more amount of energy now the next step is the transportation into the mitochondria so mitochondrial inner membrane is impermeable to almost all the fatty acid coa and molecule which are transported to the mitochondrial matrix by the carnitine shuttle so you can have a carnitine acyl transferase shuttle where you have a protein which is called as carnitine and this uh, protein is actually going to bind the uh, the acyl coenzyme synthase and uh, that's how it is actually going to help into the transportations so you have the inner membrane you have the outer membrane uh, this is the mitochondria and then how it is actually going to help is that each fatty acid coenzyme a is converted into the fatty acyl carnitine derivative in a reaction named transesterification by the enzyme carnitine acyl transferase a one which is present in the outer membrane of the mitochondria so in the outer membrane of the mitochondria you have an enzyme which is called as carnitine acyl transferase one and it is actually going to join the carnitine to the incoming fatty acids the derivative is this derivative is located to the mitochondrial matrix by the acyl carnitine carnitine translocase which is present in the inner membrane of the mitochondria this means once this is going to be formed, it is actually going to be taken up into the into the inner membrane and then you are actually going to have the acyl carnitine translocase. This is actually going to allow the entry of this uh, carnitine, carnitine conjugated uh, fatty acid molecules. And once it enter into this, then you are going to have the carnitine acyl transferase 2, which is actually going to remove. So once the fatty acid is regenerated by the carnitine acyl transferase 2, uh, located onto the matrix side of the inner mitochondria, carnitine is transported. So this carnitine protein is again transported back to the outer membrane and then it is, will be available for making a complex with the other molecule of the 
So uh, carnitine is transported back into the inner mitochondrial space uh, uh, via the acylcarnitine transporters, which is then ready for the participation into the other reaction of the activating the fatty acids. So these are the uh, this is the carnitine uh, acyl transferase shuttle, and it is actually going to uh, help in the transportation of these acetylated um, uh, uh, lipid molecules. Then we have the stages of the beta oxidation. So you can have the three stages. Stage one, you can have the beta oxidation. Stage two, oxidation of acetyl CoA, and stage three, that is called as the oxidative phosphorylation. So in the stage one, the a long chain fatty acid is oxidized to yield the acetyl residue in the form of acetyl CoA, which is known as the beta oxidation. Then the stage two, the oxidation, the acetyl CoA produced from the oxidation of the fatty acid. is further oxidized to carbon dioxide or via krebs cycle to yield the reducing balances and then the stage 3 is that whatever the reducing equivalents are being generated they will be going to so electron derived from the oxidation of the stage 1 and 2 passes to the oxygen via the mitochondrial respiratory chain for atp synthesis by the oxidative phosphorylation this means this is the stage 1 where the long chain fatty acid is actually going to be broken down after every two carbons right and then it is actually going to generate the acetyl coa so for example in this case uh, it is it is actually a 16 membered uh, carbon right uh, fat, fatty acid so it is actually going to generate the 8 acetyl coa and then all these 8 acetyl coa is going to enter into the citric acid cycle and it is actually going to generate the 16 carbon dioxide molecule and at the end it is actually going to generate the NADH and FADH2. Along with that, it is going to generate the ATP, GTP, and all that. And then in the stage three, NADH and FADH2 is actually going to enter into the oxidative phosphorylation, and that's how it is actually going to generate the large quantity of ATP. So let's talk about the stage one, which is the beta oxidations, right? So this is the stage one. All the reactions of the stage one. so once the fatty acid coa uh, molecules are exported to the mitochondrial matrix they are subjected to the repeated four step process each time the chain length reduces by the two carbon right till the final product is acetyl coa itself right so for example if you start with the palmitoyl it is first going to break this bond right and then it is actually going to break uh, subsequent to that so uh, So, so there are multiple steps in the beta oxidations. So, first step is the oxidation. The first reaction is catalyzed by the three isozymes of acyl CoA dehydrogenase. Uh, so, it is a flavoprotein with FADA as the prosthetic group. The electron extracted from the fatty acid CoA are transferred to the FAD and a reduced form of dehydrogenase immediately imparts its electron to an electron carrier of the mitochondrial respiratory chain which is an electron transferring flavoprotein the reaction is analogous to the succeeded dehydrogenase reaction in the citric acid cycle where fad act as an electron receptor so in the step 1 you are uh, the uh, acyl coa dehydrogenase is actually going to participate and it is going to oxidize the uh, carbon right then in the step 2 it there will be a hydrolysis So in the second step of beta oxidation cycle the water is added to the double bond of the trans enol CoA to form the beta hydroxyl acyl CoA the reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme which is called as the enol CoA hydrolase and uh, which is similar to the reaction performed by the fumarase enzyme into the uh, citric acid cycle and then the third step is the oxidation in the third step the beta hydroxyl acyl CoA undergoes uh, dehydrogen dehydrogenation so synthesize the beta keto acyl coa via the enzyme known as the beta hydroxy acyl coa dehydrogenase here the nad plus act as an electron acceptor the nadh formed in the above reaction transferred its electron to the nadh dehydrogenase an electron carrier of the respiratory chain so what will happen is that by the end of these uh, beta oxidations it is actually going to produce the acetyl coa then we have the stage uh, step 4 where you are going to have the thiolysis 
So in the final reaction of the beta oxidation cycle, the beta keto acyl CoA is cleaved by the reaction with the thiol group of the coenzyme A to yield an acetyl CoA molecule and the coenzyme A thioester of the fatty acid. Shortened by the two carbon atom, the reaction is performed by the enzyme acyl CoA acyl transferase, right? So, for example, if we start with a uh, fatty acid which is C16, the product is going to be undergo for the 8 oxidation, a, uh, uh, the product after 1 beta oxidation will be C14, right? So, after 1 beta oxidation, it is going to be C14, right? This means the 2 carbon which comes out is actually going to produce the acetyl CoA, right? This is the acetyl CoA, right, which is going to be produced. And the C14 carbon, what is left, is actually going to be go through the these reactions again. This means it will go again, then there will be uh, acylation and all that, right? So, uh, so, this means it will continue till you are actually going to have the C2 on this side and you are going to have the acetyl CoA, right? So, it's actually going to give you the acetyl CoA at the end. This means if you start with the C16, what you are going to get is you are going to get 8 acetyl CoA enzyme, acetyl CoA molecule, right, which will enter into the crate uh, cycle. And uh, on the top, it is also going to produce the NADH and it's also going to produce the FADH and it's going to produce the ATP if required, okay? So, uh, and all these eight molecules will enter into the Krebs cycle. Now, in the stage two of oxidation of acetyl-CoA, Considering the permitoyl CoA C16, one beta oxidation will give you the myristyl CoA and an acetyl CoA enzyme, which undergoes six more round of beta oxidation to get the completely oxidized to yield the seven more acetyl CoA molecule. All the acetyl CoA molecule produced into the beta oxidation of a single fatty acid molecule, fatty acyl CoA molecule, get further oxidized in Krebs cycle to yield the NADH and FADH2. This means the one molecule of acetyl CoA produces three NADH molecule, one FADH2 molecule, and one ATP or GTP. This means the eight acetyl CoA molecule is going to give you the 24 NADH molecule, eight FADH2 molecule, and eight ATP. Overall reaction for a palmitoyl CoA can be can be represented as follows. Palmitoyl CoA plus seven COA plus seven FAD plus 7 NADS, the 7 water molecule give you the 8 acetyl CoA plus 7 FADH2 plus 7 NADH plus 7 hydrogen molecule. This means if you started with the C16, it will actually going to leave one molecule of acetyl CoA and it's actually going to small by the 2 atom. Same is true by all these, right? And ultimately what will happen is that when the C14 it is actually going to produce the acetyl CoA and it is also going to produce the remaining molecule is going to be the acetyl CoA. This means the beta oxidation is actually going to generate a huge quantity or the lipid molecules are actually going to generate a huge quantity of energy, right? Remember that from the one acetyl CoA, right? One acetyl CoA, you are actually going to generate 15 ATP molecule, right, under the Krebs cycle. This means if I have one uh, oxidation of one permitoyl CoA, right, uh, one, one permitoyl CoA, it is actually going to generate the 8 ATP, 8 acetyl CoA molecule. This means it is actually going to generate approximately uh, 120 ATP molecules, right, from the beta oxidation. Whereas it is also going to generate some more, more amount of NADH and FADH2 even from the beta oxidation step as well. Now, how you are going to do a regulation of fatty acid biosynthesis and catabolism? So, fatty acid regulation, biosynthesis and catabolism is completely being regulated by the location of the fatty acids. So, in the liver, the fatty acyl CoA has two major pathways. 
it can either transport it to the mitochondria via the carnitine shuttle to get oxidized or it can be converted into the thioacyl glycerol and phospholipid via the cytosolic enzyme. The carnitine shuttle, which is a three-step process, is the rate limiting step for the fatty acid oxidation and therefore it is an important point of regulation. Once the fatty acids are transported to the mitochondrial matrix, they are destined, destined for the beta oxidation. So remember that if the carnitine uh, shuttle is not going to be working or if it is not uh, functional, then the, then the lipid molecules or fatty acid will not enter into the mitochondria for beta oxidation. Instead, they will go for the cytosolic enzyme and they will be Ritualized for the synthesis of the phospholipids and the triacylglycerols. And these are the storage molecules or sometimes the phospholipids are going to be a part of plasma membrane. Uh, so, manolyl-CoA, the first intermediate of the fatty acid biosynthesis via the acetyl-CoA also regulates the fatty acid oxidation. When there is an ample amount of glucose supplied to the liver, fatty acid synthesis uh, begins from the acetyl-CoA which produces the manual coa that inhibits the carnitine acyl transferase 1. This means if you have the enough amount of glucose, so that means the glucose is enough to give you the energy and in that case what will happen is that the acetyl coa is actually going to be withdrawn from the Krebs cycle, right? So this means if you have enough quantity from the glucose oxidation, there will be an excess of acetyl coa, right? And this acetyl-CoA then would be working as a precursor for the fatty acid biosynthesis. And this acetyl-CoA, the first molecule what it is going to produce is the manolyl-CoA, right? And manolyl-CoA is actually a inhibitor of the inhibitor of the carnitine acyl transferase, right? The first enzyme which is uh, in the carnitine shuttle, right? And if the first enzyme in the carnitine shuttle is not working, it is not going to attach the carnitine to the fatty acids and as a result, there will be no transport of fatty acid from the cytosol to the mitochondria and as a result, it is not going to go through to the beta oxidation. Instead, it is actually going to be utilized for the fatty acid biosynthesis. This means it is going to be utilized for the tri synthesis of triacylglycerol or the synthesis of the other phospholipids. Uh, so when the NADH and NAD plus ratio is very high, this means the cell is sufficient enough with the energy. Okay. So if you can imagine like that. Okay. If it is a very high ratio, this means you have more amount of NADH and you have less amount of NAD plus, that means the cell has sufficient energy then it is indicating the enough energy for the cell to perform vital activities. beta hydroxy coenzyme dehydrogenase is also being inhibited. High concentration of acetyl coa inhibits the thiolase, right? So these are the enzymes or which are actually functional within the uh, for during the beta oxidations. During the time of vigorous muscle contraction, the strenuous exercise or fasting, the consumption of ATP is increased, which reduces the concentration of ATP and increases the AM, increases AMP that activates the AMPK, the AMP activated protein kinase and the AMPK phosphorylate various other targets enzymes such as style-CoA carboxylase which catalyzes the manual coa synthesis. This phosphorylation and thereby inhibition of coenzyme carboxylase bring down the concentration of manual coa relieving the inhibition of fatty acid uh, acyl tra carnitine transporters into the mitochondria and allowing the degradation of the stored fat to undergo oxidation to regain supply of ATP, ATP from the fats. Uh, so there are, these are the things, right? If you have the high glucose molecules, you are actually going to produce the insulin and insulin is actually going to participate into the fatty acid biosynthesis and regulation. So when the blood glucose level is high, the insulin dependent protein phosphatases dephosphorylate the acetyl-CoA carboxylase, thereby activating it. And ACC starts sizing the manual coa which inhibits the carnitine acyl transferase 1 and thereby 
preventing the entry of fatty acid coenzyme fatty acid coa fatty acyl coa into the mitochondria this means once you have the high blood glucose level it is actually going to induce the production of insulin and once there will be an induction of insulin it is insulin will actually go and bind to the insulin receptor and that in turn is actually going to produce the large quantity of phosphatases and once the large quantity of phosphatases is uh, produced it will actually going to uh, you know dephosphorylate the uh, acyl -CO acetyl coa carboxylase so acetyl coa carboxylase is inactive when it is phosphorylated and it is active when it is dephosphorylated or native form so once the phosphatases are produced they are actually going to have the active acc and what is the job of the active acc is that it is actually going to take up the acetyl coa from the krebs cycle and it is actually going to produce the manolyl ka and manolyl coa is actually going to form the fatty acid and manolyl coa is actually a very very potent inhibitor of the carnitine acyl transferase 1 so this means it is actually going to destroy the carnitine shuttle and once it is destroying the carnitine shuttle it is actually going to destroy the transport of fatty acid into the mitochondria and if it is destroying the entry of the mitro fatty acid into the mitochondria it is actually going to abolish the uh, beta oxidation of the fatty acids and as a result it is actually going to promote more the synthesis rather than the degradation of the fatty acids so that's why it is always been recommended that if you want to reduce the amount of fat into your body you always should ensure that there is no enough glucose present this means what it means is that it is not the fat which actually increases the fat level it is the glucose which actually increases the fat level because if you have a high quantity of glucose within the blood it is actually going to promote the synthesis of fat rather than the uh, fat burnout right and that's why it is important that we should uh, have the less amount of glucose into the blood so when the blood glucose level drops the glucagon release activates the pka which phosphorylate and inactivate the ACC. The concentration of the melanin CoA drops, which relieves the inhibited entry of fatty acid into the mitochondria and replenishes the beta oxidation. So, this is all about the uh, catabolic reactions, what we have just discussed, right? And what we have discussed, we have discussed about the catabolic reaction of the glucose and the lipids or the fatty acids and within the glucose we have discussed about the uh, glycolysis and we also discuss about the uh, Krebs cycle whereas in the case of lipid molecules we have discussed about the beta oxidation and how the beta oxidation is producing the acetyl coa and then if this acetyl coa is entering into the Krebs cycle and that it's now it is actually going to produce the large quantity of energy in the form of ATP. So now once you have generated the large quantity of ATP, this ATP is actually going to be utilized into the anabolic reactions. Anabolic reaction means the biosynthetic reactions and anabolic reactions are required for the growth of the organism or growth of the person, right? Because if you want to grow, for example, if you want to grow from 1 mm to 1 centimeter, right? This means you actually require the enough quantity of material, right? So that you can actually be able to, for example, if you want to increase the length, right? So you also have to synthesize the muscles, right? And muscles is nothing but a made up of, of the different types of protein molecules, lipid molecules, right? So you also require the synthesis of protein and lipids and you also require the nucleic acid, right? So if the, you want to do a synthesis, you also require the energy. So energy you have already produced, right? And this all energy is the endogenous energy, it's not the exogenous energy, right? And I'm sure you all uh, very much uh, aware of what is mean by the endogenous energy, what is mean by the exogenous energy, right? For example, if you take a carbon molecule, 
if you take a carbon right and if you this if you burn this carbon it is actually going to give you the energy right this is a exogenous energy because it is always present outside right that's how you do actually you take the carbon you burn it and that's how you keep it into a corner of your room and that actually keep the room, uh, room warm actually but this is not going to remain continuous right whereas in these cases you are actually producing the energy by uh, running the different types of metabolic reactions within your body right so these are the endogenous energy and that energy is actually going to be utilized for forming the bonds between the constituents for example in this case if you want to make the protein you always have to make the bond between the amino acids if you want the lipid synthesis you always have to make the bond between the fatty acid and glycerol uh, similarly for the nucleic acid you always have to make the bond between the nucleotides molecule and that's how it is actually going to synthesize the genome for the new cell it is going to synthesize the plasma membrane for the new cell it will also require the synthesis of the protein for the new cell and once you have all these raw material the cell is actually going to enlarge in size and that's how the it will actually going to help into the growth of the organism so let's discuss about the anabolic reactions and what we are going to discuss we are going to discuss about the biosynthesis of the amino acids where all this energy is going to be utilized so amino acid biosynthesis amino acid are categorized into the two different category essential and non essential amino acid based on the biosynthesis thus the amino acids which are actually you which you can be able to synthesize in your body by the raw material are called as the non essential amino acids because these are the amino acid which you can be able to synthesize from the raw material whereas the amino acids for which either you don't have the biosynthetic pathway or you cannot synthesize from the raw material because you don't have the requisite uh, bio uh, biosynthetic pathway they are called as the essential amino acids so for the plant plant can be able to synthesize all the amino acids so it is actually all the amino acids are non essential amino acids for the plant because plants can easily take the carbon dioxide water and the uh, other metabolites and it can be able to synthesize all amino acids because the plant has the biosynthetic pathway for all the amino acids whereas the animals are dependent on the plant to provide the amino acids right so these are the amino acid which are essential so these are the essential amino acids for which there is no pathway present in the animals right this means these are the amino acid which it has to take from the plant so it plant has to provide these and how the plant provide these plants are actually giving you the different types of uh, uh, raw material right for example pulses right so if you take the pulse pulse is actually going to be get digested into the digestive system and it is actually going to release the different types of amino acids for example if you take the rice right rice is also going to produce some amount of amino acid which are forming into the essential amino acids and then you have the non essential amino acids where you actually have the biosynthetic pathway so you have the pathway and you just require the uh raw material right so you actually require the ammonia you require the carbon dioxide you require all those kind of thing and then you can be able to produce the these amino acids or sometimes some of these amino acids are also being derived from the essential amino acids so that's how also you can actually be able to have the biosynthetic pathway so these are the 10 amino acids and these are also 10 amino acids so biosynthesis of the amino acids principally all amino acids are derived either from the glycolysis or citric acid cycle or pentose phosphate intermediates these derivatives provide the carbon skeleton from the amino acids whereas amino group or the nitrogen in the same is provided either by the glutamine or the glutamate not all the amino acids are synthesized by the organisms which they need for which they need from the outer environment either in the form of protein or from the dietary food 
these amino acids which they cannot synthesize by the organism are called as essential amino acid and the rest are called as non essential amino acid the most important reaction that take part in almost all the biosynthetic pathway of different amino acids are reductive amination of the alpha keto acids or the transamination reactions or require a coenzyme plp that is a pyrimidine phosphate so this is an overview of the amino acid synthesis where you actually have the different types of amino acids derived from the carbohydrate metabolism this, this is the uh, glycolysis what you see here is from the from here to here right this is the uh, glycolysis and then from the pyruvate this is the krebs cycle okay and what you see here is that for from the first for example from the glucose you can actually be able to have the ribulose phosphate and from that you can actually be able to have the synthesis of histidine similarly from the 3 phosphoglycerate you can have the synthesis of serine and once you have synthesized the serine that serine can be converted into the glycine and the cysteine similarly uh, 3 phosphoglycerate can enter into the pentose phosphate pathway and then pentose phosphate pathway is going to generate the erythrose 4 phosphate and that along with the phosphoenal pyruvate can give you a uh, all the aromatic amino acid like tryptophan phenylalanine and tyrosine and then we also have the uh, other amino acids like aspartate asparagine methionine theonine all that from the krebs cycle like the oxaloacetates right similarly from the alpha ketoglutarate you can actually be able to produce the glutamate by the uh, different types of metabolic reactions and once you produce the glutamate you can convert that into the glutamine proline and arginine Similarly, from the pyruvate, you can be able to produce the alanine, valine, leucine, and isoleucine. So, based on the these kind of scheme, the amino acid biosynthesis uh, can be can be decided into the different families. So, you can have the glutamate family, you can have the pyruvate family, you can have aspartate family, serine family, aromatic amino acids. and you can also have the histidine family so when you talk about the glutamate family you all the only what you need required is you are require the synthesis of the glutamate once you synthesize the glutamate you can be able to synthesize the glutamate glutamine arginine and proline similarly once you have the pyruvate from the pyruvate you can be able to generate the valine alanine leucine and isoleucine as from the aspartate you can be able to synthesize all these from the serine you can be able to synthesize all these from the aromatic amino acids you can be able to have the tryptophan phenylalanine and tyrosine so let's start first with the glutamate family okay so biosynthesis of the glutamate and glutamine so from the alpha ketoglutarate uh, which is present in the krebs cycle right uh, you can be able to synthesize the glutamate and once you synthesize the glutamate you can be able to convert that glutamate into glutamine proline or the arginine so biosynthesis of the glutamate and glutamine so glutamine synthesis is an important mechanism of ammonia assimilation transportation in different cells and secretion therefore after right so free ammonia ion free ammonia is toxic for the cell which is converted into glutamine for the transportation in bacteria and plant the glutamate is derived from the glutamine catalyzes from the glutamine catalyzed by an enzyme known as GOG cat or the glutamate oxoglutarate amino transferase here the glutamine act as a nitrogen donor and the alpha ketoglutarate undergoes the reductive deaminations so what you have is you have the alpha ketoglutarate glutamine NADPH ATP remember this is NADPH not the NADH and it is actually going to produce the two molecules of glutamate plus NADH so you are actually going to utilize the not only the atp but also in the form of reducing equivalents animals do not have the glutamate synthase therefore they maintain the high level of glutamate by transamination of the alpha glutarate while the amino acid catabolism glutamate can also be formed by the glutamate dehydrogenase in the single step reaction uh, given below the reaction take place in the mitochondria the reaction cannot distinguish between nadh and nadph so alpha ketoglutarate with ammonia nadph give you the l glutamate and nad plus 
Then we have the biosynthesis of the serine, glycine, and cysteine. So from the three phosphoglycerate, so three phosphoglycerate you are going to get from the uh, glycolysis, right? And from the glycolysis, then the three phosphoglycerate can be produced into the serine, and serine can be converted into glycine and uh, cysteine. So biosynthesis of serine, glycine, and cysteine. So serine is derived from the oxidation of 3-phosphoglycerate by the phosphoglycerate dehydrogenase in the presence of NAD plus to produce the 3-phosphoglyhydroxypyruvate. And glutamine synthesis transfer its amino group to the above synthesized product to yield the 3-phosphoserine uh, followed by the hydrolysis of phosphate group by the enzyme called as phosphoserine phosphatase. To yield the serine, right? The pathway for serine and glycine are almost the same except for the synthesis of glycine after the removal of carbon atom from the serine by an enzyme called serine hydroxymethyltransferase or the SHMT. Uh, in the above reactions, the beta carbon of the serine is accepted by the tetrahydrofolate in the presence of PLP. In plant and bacteria, cysteine is derived from the serine for and for which the sulfur is obtained from the environmental sulfates. First, an acetyl group is attached to the serine from the acetyl CoA to form the O acetyl serine. This reaction is performed by the enzyme serine acetyl uh, transferase. The, the reduced sulfur is then incorporated into our product by an enzyme called O acetyl serine thiolase to yield the cysteine. In mammals, the process is quite different. The carbon skeleton and the sulfur for cysteine biosynthesis is given by the two different amino acids that is the serine and the methionine respectively. So these are the reactions what is being shown here, right? You have the, you start with the 3 phosphoglycerate, it gets converted into 3 phosphohydroxypyruvate, and then the glutamate is going to give you the amino group, and that's how it is actually going to form the 3 phosphoserine. And 3 phosphoserine is actually going to be hydrolyzed and it's actually going to give you the serine and once the serine is being produced uh, with the help of the enzyme called serine hydroxymethyltransferate it's going to be get converted into the glycine and remember that tetrahydrofolate or n5 n10 methylene tetrahydrofolate is actually a shuttle between the nucleic acid and the protein molecules okay so that's why this enzyme is actually can be shuttle the carbon pool between the uh, protein metabolism as well as the nucleic acid metabolism. And then we have the biosynthesis of the aspart family amino acids. So oxaloacetate, you have transaminations to form the aspartate and from the aspartate you can have the amidation to produce the arginine, asparagine. From the aspartate you can have the methionine, threonine and lysine. Uh, then we have the biosynthesis of the pyruvate family amino acids. So pyruvate family, pyruvate after the transamination can produce the alanine and the pyruvate uh, can produce the valine, isoleucine and leucine. So uh, and then we have the biosynthesis of the aspartate and alanine. So carbon skeleton for aspartate and alanine is derived from the oxaloacetate and pyruvate respectively, whereas the amino group is provided by the glutamine for both the amino acids. Uh, in the above reaction, the alpha glutarate is formed as the byproduct along with the alanine and aspartate as amino acid. This is an example of the transamination reaction and it is catalyzed by the amino transferase uh, in the presence of coenzyme PLP. So you have the this kind of transamination reactions where you one side you have the oxaloacetate and glutamate and this side you are going to generate the aspartate and the alpha glutarate so it can actually go in both the directions so depending upon whether you require the aspartate or whether you require the glutamate it can actually be able to convert the enzymes uh, convert the amino acid into each other same is true for the pyruvate and alanine also and then we have the biosynthesis of the proline and the arginine. So these are the reactions what you're going to have the, for the biosynthesis of the proline and arginine. So it starts with the glutamate. Glutamate is actually going to be, uh, you know, having the energy of the ATP and it is actually going to form the gamma glutamyl phosphate and there will be a phosphorylation reaction, right? So it is going to be catalyzed by an enzyme called glutamate kinase. And once you generate the gamma glutamyl phosphate, then gamma glutamyl phosphate is going to be reduced 
by an enzyme called gamma glutamyl phosphate reductase and that is going to form the glutamate semi aldehyde and then this semi aldehyde is actually going to be get converted into the pyrroline 5 carboxylase carboxylate and this 5 carboxylate carboxylase is further going to be reduced by enzyme called pyrroline carboxylate reductase and ultimately it is going to form the proline in animals, the arginine is produced from the glutamate in the urea cycle. Principally, arginine is der derivative of the ornithine, which can also be produced from the glutamate gamma semi aldehyde by transamination reaction. But cyclization of gamma semi aldehyde interdict the enough supply of the same to synthesize the ornithine. In the case of bacteria, there is a de novo pathway altogether for the formation of ornithine and therefore arginine. So, uh, biosynthesis of the aromatic amino acids, so from the phosphoenol pyruvate, it is actually going to combine with the arthrosis phosphate from the uh, pentose phosphate pathway and that's how it is actually going to form the tryptophan, tyrosine and phenylalanine and tryptophan can further be converted into tyrosine if required. So, from the chorismate, uh, it is actually going to form the anthranalanine and then from here, it is actually going to form the enolyl bone carboxyphenyl amino the carboxyribulose phosphate and from here it is actually going to form the indole 3 glycerol phosphate and ultimately it is going to be get converted into the tryptophan. So once it is going to form the tryptophan it can be get converted into the tyrosine. So enzyme tryptophan synthase uh, which performed the last reaction in the conversion from the chorismate to tryptophan has two subunit alpha 2 beta 2 that perform the two different parts of the whole reaction indole 3 glycerol phosphate alpha subunit is going to form the indole plus glyceraldehyde plus 3 phosphate and indole plus serine is actually going to form the tryptophan and there will be a water bowl of water indole formed in the first part of the reaction is moved through the channel from the alpha subunit the beta subunit activate active site where it undergoes condensation with shift base intermediate such as DPLP and serine and in animal the tyrosine can be formed by the hydroxyl hydroxylation phenylalanine at uh, C4 position by an enzyme called phenyl hydroxylase. So this is the uh, tyrosine right and when you have the phenyl hydroxylase it is actually going to form the so this is the phenylalanine actually. And when it has the uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase, there will be hydroxylation reaction. So it's going to have the hydroxylation on this side and it's actually going to form the tyrosine. Then we have the biosynthesis of phenylalanine and tyrosine in plant and bacteria. So in the plants and bacteria, the phenylalanine and tyrosine is derived from the chorismate where prefinate is a common intermediate and then the pathway diverges to the two branches. One forming the tyrosine from the 4-hydroxypyruvate and the other forming the phenylalanine from the phenylpyruvate. Uh, the final reaction is the transamination that involves the transfer of the amino group from the glutamine. So this is the pathway what is being shown, right? From the chorismate, it is going to form the pifinate and at this stage, it is going to bifurcate into the two pathway and one side, it is going to form the 4-hydroxyphenylpyruvate, other side, it is going to form the phenylpyruvate and then it is actually going to have the transamination reaction and that's how it is going on this side it is going to form the tyrosine whereas in this side it is actually going to form the phenylalanine. So regulation of the amino acid biosynthesis. So you can have the regulation of the uh, different types of biosynthetic pathways and it all depends on the availability of the different types of metabolites and that's how they are actually going either going to upregulate or downregulate the different enzyme activities. For example, in this case, the glutamate synthase, so amino acid biosynthesis is aerosterically regulated. The end product of the pathway generally regulate the enzyme that catalyzes the initial step of the pathway. Along with the electrolytic modulation, feedback inhibition is also being seen to regulate the amino acid biosynthesis. Glutamine synthetase is an important enzyme that participates in almost all the reaction methods. Uh, all, all of the amino acid biosynthetic reaction. Therefore, this enzyme is inhibited by the various other molecules such as AMP, CTP, glycine, alanine, etc. 
The other mechanism seen are the sequential feedback mechanism, which are more profound in the aromatic amino acid biosynthetic pathway. And this mechanism, the amino acid phenylalanine, uh, tyrosine, tryptophan sequentially inhibit the three isozyme of the enzyme THP, and that's how it is actually going to inhibit the uh, synthesis of the aromatic amino acids. So this is all about the amino acid biosynthesis. And what we have discussed, we have discussed about the uh, catabolic reactions and we have also discussed about the anabolic reactions. And uh, at the, uh, so uh, the purpose of the catabolic reaction is to produce the energy, whereas the purpose of the anabolic reaction is to utilize that energy for the synthesis of the different biomolecules which they require for the synthesis of the different types of uh, biomolecules such as proteins, lipids and uh, uh, and the genome, right? And all this is required for the synthesis of the new cell so that it they can be able to uh, grow from the uh, unicellular organisms to multicellular organisms or they can actually be able to produce the more number of cells so that they can be able to increase their number. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to see uh, more aspects of the uh, biological system. Thank you. Thank you.